Welcome to the uh, a wonderful event co-hosted by me and uh, Cambridge University students in pseudoscience and Biosoc, which we introduced Professor Edzard Ernst. We're talking about alternative medicine today. Um, if any, I know there's quite a few of you here from from uh, Cambridge University students in pseudoscience. But for anyone who hasn't heard of them before, please feel free to uh, check out our um, check us out on Facebook. We're also active on the um, Cambridge SU, SU page. We do a lot of events about pseudoscience and about things like anti-vaccination beliefs, conspiratorial beliefs. We'll be uh, hosting lots of events next term. So um, without any further ado, I'll uh, hand you over to Shreyas and uh, please enjoy the event, everyone. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Luis. Uh, so from Biosoc, uh, a warm welcome to everyone here um, for our last event of the term. And um, so before I start, I'll just uh, quickly introduce our sponsor. So we'd like to thank our first corporate sponsor of the year, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome editing company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenics-based therapies, as well as providing educational resources. Today, we are honored to have Professor Edzard Ernst as our speaker. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction. He was formerly a professor of complementary medicine at the University of Exeter, the first such academic position in the world. He's a founder of three medical journals and has been a columnist for many publications. His work has been awarded with 17 scientific awards and two visiting professorships. And during the last 25 years, Professor Ernst's research focused on the critical evaluation of all aspects of so-called alternative medicine. Um, he does not aim to promote this or that therapy and his goal is to provide objective evidence, reliable information and critical assessments. Um, just before we start the talk, um, I'd like to say that we're gonna have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so if you're watching um, on YouTube, if you're watching on Zoom, please do put your questions in the chat, um, send them to me if you want personally, um, and there will be a Q&A. I'd also like to mention that we will be live streaming this on YouTube and putting it up later. So if uh, you do not want to be on that live stream, uh, kindly turn your camera off now and uh, you can message me if you have any questions for the Q&A session. Uh, so without much further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Professor Ernst. Hello. Thank you so much for getting me to this event. Um, I'm currently in, in Brittany, so I'm, I'm, I'm not actually in, in Cambridge, even though I do live in Cambridge uh, normally. I'm going to talk about uh, a, an attempt to critically evaluate so-called alternative medicine. And this is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Then I'm going to ask how we apply science to so-called alternative medicine. Uh, give you an example, uh, one that is uh, rather often dis discussed, uh, homeopathy. Um, I'm going to ask why so many patients swear by ineffective therapies. Um, I'm going to explain that not all scams are scams. Um, I'm going to mention the safety issue, which I think is quite important. Um, more good than harm is, is probably one of the key questions, and I'm going to arrive eventually at some conclusions, I hope. Uh, first of all, maybe uh, a little um, thought about the terminology of all this. Um, most people call it alternative medicine. If you, if you search for it, alternative medicine is probably the best term. On Google, you find f about 50 million websites on uh, alternative medicine. My chair in Exeter already mentioned was called complementary medicine that takes into account that not everybody uses as uh, these these treatments as a as an alternative but as a complement. Cam is very popular as well, uh, uh, taking into account that some treatments may be alternative and others may be complementary. Um, overlapping terms are natural medicine, unorthodox medicine, traditional medicine, fringe medicine, integrated medicine, integrative medicine, 
etc. Uh, so it, it, a really big confusion about terminology. And I contribute to that confusion by calling it scam, so-called alternative medicine. Why do I do that? Why not just alternative medicine like most other people? Three reasons, really. Uh, first, if a therapy does not work, it cannot possibly be an alternative to anything. Second, if a therapy does work, it's just medicine. It's not alternative medicine. And thirdly, I've written a book called SCAM, so-called alternative medicine. And uh, of course, I like to mention that because you're all going to buy it. Um, a little bit about me, you've already heard this, uh, in the introduction, a little bit. And uh, the, the story basically is that uh, I, I come from a family of doctors. My grandfather was a doctor, my, my father was a doctor, and our family physician was a homeopath. I grew up in, in Germany, I studied medicine in, in Munich, and uh, by coincidence, uh, my first job as a junior doctor was in a homeopathic hospital. Subsequently, I became a conventional physician, conducted about 10 years of basic research. Then I became a specialist in rehabilitation medicine, um, had a chair of rehabilitation medicine in Vienna. And in 1993, I was appointed to the chair uh, to create the chair uh, in complementary medicine at Exeter. Um, there I searched, researched all types of uh, so-called alternative medicine for about 25 years. We published together 20, uh, plenty of papers, uh, plenty of books. Um, and in 2012, I retired, became emeritus professor. And today I give lectures, write books, and run a blog, which is quite lively at times, and which you ought to visit. I have had hands-on training as a, as a physician, as a clinician, in all these alternative treatments. Um, so um, I've, I've used them as a clinician, I've used them as a patient, and I've certainly done my research in this area. These are the types of alternative medicine that we researched. Some things very, very exotic, but um, our emphasis was on acupuncture, on herbal medicine, on spinal manipulation, which is chiropractic and osteopathy, and on homeopathy, of course. Time to define what I understand by uh, so-called alternative medicine. I think it's an umbrella term uh, for a diverse range of therapeutic and diagnostic modalities. We often forget the diagnostic modalities and they have little in common other than uh, being outside mainstream medicine. And it really goes from A to Z, from acupuncture to zone therapy. Somebody counted 400 different modalities under this umbrella term. And you understand that it's difficult to uh, um, generalize across this wide range of modalities. This slide shows you why SCAM is an important topic, whether you like it or not. Um, it's important foremost because it's very much used by the general population. These are figures uh, related to surveys of the general population. Um, and we can see that the UK in 2005 um, had a prevalence of usage of about 25%. You can also see that my home country, Germany, uh, is, um, has a much, much higher usage. And it's not complimentary at, uh, in the sense that it's free, quite the opposite. We, we spend a lot of money on 
so-called alternative medicine. Um, you can you can see see the figures here. I think we are around eighty billion dollars at, at present, and most of this money is out, at least in, in Britain. In Germany is a little bit different. In in Britain, it's out of the pocket of the consumer. The NHS pays very little of it. A little bit more background on so-called alternative medicine. The press have a very keen interest on, on SCAM. When I was still working at Exeter, there, there was uh, certainly not a week, hardly ever a day without the press phoning up, wanting some sort of quote. There are powerful lobby groups um, which promote the integration of SCAM into the NHS. Con consumers are bombarded with what I call fake news, misleading news about uh, all sorts of alternative medicines. Most doctors have very little interest uh, in it, which is uh, strange because uh, I think they ought to if so many of their patients use it. Many consumers are quasi-religious believers uh, in, in this area. And you probably have encountered that as well in private discussions. Critical thinking seems to be uh, uh, something that is alien to, to the whole field. Um, and many, many VIPs promote scam. Uh, the next slide shows you some of them. I, I start with uh, the guy on the top right. This is uh, Dr. Oz who has a television show in America, very popular. Hussein Bolt, um, uh, a promoter of homeopathy. Then we have Prince Charles, of course, uh, promoter of every, anything alternative. Uh, Olivia Newton-John, who is presently being treated for uh, re cancer recurrence uh, with uh, alternative medicine. Then we have uh, uh, Arnie Schwarzenegger, who promotes chiropractic. We have uh, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, who makes millions by selling all sorts of uh, strange things. And we have two Nobel Prize winners, uh, who, uh, uh, Luc Montagnier, co-discoverer of, co of the AIDS virus who uh, says a lot of interesting things about homeopathy. And uh, Linus Pauling, uh, who had told two Nobel Prizes, I think the only person who uh, ever had two Nobel Prizes. And he uh, was the, the one who more or less invented also molecular medicine, which is high dose vitamins, basically. So, um, applying science to SCAM. How, how do we apply science? How do we find out whether a therapy works? Do we try it ourselves? Do we, do we give it to our pet? Do we ask our gran? Do we throw dice? Do we ask our neighbor? Ni neither of these. Um, if we want to find out whether treatment works, the only solution to, to that problem is really running a clinical trial. And that is not very complicated. In a typical clinical trial, you have a group of patients, which you divide into two subgroups, A and B. A is being treated with the experimental treatment. B is being treated with something else. This could be a placebo. It could be a standard uh, treatment. It could be nothing. This runs for a little while. Um, and, and then we compare the results. It's as simple as that. And there's no reason whatsoever why we cannot uh, test alternative treatments with clinical trials like that. In fact, the very first clinical trial in the history of medicine was a trial of what we would 
today undoubtedly call alternative medicine. This was 1747. James Lind was the uh, Navy doctor at the time and the investigator, and uh, he did sailors uh, for scurvy. He wanted to prevent scurvy, which was a real problem for the British Navy at, at the time. And he ran a trial with 12 sailors. Two sailors each got all sorts of exotic alternative treatments. And as an afterthought, he threw in a couple of oranges and a lemon as well, uh, not knowing uh, quite why he did it, but he, he, he just did that. He probably had, had too, too many lemons uh, and oranges left. Uh, in any case, even though the, the, the sample sizes, two sailors, <clears throat> were so tiny, uh, the result was very convincing uh, in, in that the two sailors with oranges and lemon didn't uh, get scurvy, all the others did get scurvy, and he concluded that uh, oranges and lemon prevent scurvy. He concluded this very rightly. Um, and he didn't know why. He hadn't heard of vitamin C because it wasn't discovered, but it's because of vitamin C. Scurvy is a, a, is a um, deficit of uh, vitamin C. So that was the first trial in the history of medicine. The first ever placebo-controlled double-blind randomized trial is a, was a trial of homeopathy. It took place in 1835 in Nuremberg, Germany. And it showed quite clearly that the homeopathic remedy tested in this trial was indistinguishable from, from placebo. In other words, it was a placebo. So that's a little bit of history. And as we're already talking about homeopathy, I'll show you a little bit of evidence related to homeopathy. Homeopathy was invented by Samuel Hahnemann, a German physician, uh, and the Germans are very proud of uh, Hahnemann. On this postage stamp, they call him uh, Helfer der Menschheit, Helper of Mankind. And he sought to discover that like cures like he said in his in 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 his book, um, every medicine which produces most of the symptoms present in a given disease is capable of curing that disease. That is the like cures like principle. Um, it sounds complicated, but it's very very simple indeed. If you cut an onion, uh, your eyes might start watering. To a homeopath, that indicates that any condition associated with watery eyes needs to be treated with onion. That's the like cures like principle. And many people think that homeopathy is made of natural products, basically of plants like the onion, and often it is. But homeopathy can homeopathic remedies can be made out of anything. This is the famous Berlin Wall remedy by Ainsworth, by appointment of Her Majesty the Queen. Um, and Berl what does the Berlin Wall do? It, it inhibits contact. So if you have problems in establishing contact with other people, you might be prescribed Berlin Wall in the past. Uh, that's the like cures like principle again. But of course, homeopaths don't uh, prescribe the onion for wa uh, watery eyes or the Berlin Wall, but they dilute it and they dilute it and they dilute it and they dilute it. Um, and at each step, they shake the remedy uh, heavily, uh, a process which they call succussion. What happens in terms of concentration of the onion or Berlin Wall or whatever, is that um, at each dilution step, the concentration of the, the original content uh, is drastically diminished. 
And here we only see uh, four dilution steps, but typically uh, uh, homeopaths dilute much, much more. Um, and the, the most popular remedy is one that is 30 times diluted at a ratio of one to 100. That means it's diluted to a degree that it equals less than one molecule per universe. And you can imagine that uh, scientists have difficulty in believing that a homeopathic remedy that is so dilute can actually have a health effects. So does it work? Homeopaths swear it does. And they show us evidence like this one. This is a study from the Bristol Homeopathic Hospital, which is now closed. An observational study of almost 7,000 people, so very impressive. They were treated with homeopathy and 71% reported positive health effects. The authors concluded that homeopathic treatment is a valuable intervention. Uh, this is most impressive unless you know that an observational study has no control group. So you don't know whether this, uh, uh, these positive results wouldn't have happened anyway. And unless you know that the intervention was not just homeopathy, but uh, also um, any anything else that the patients needed in terms of conventional uh, medicine. So the explanation of the positive result could be a placebo response, it could be the natural history of the disease, it could be a regression towards the mean, um, etc. We have done a clinical trial uh, which avoids all these pitfalls. It was randomized, meaning that the two groups were um, uh, as equal as they can possibly be. It was double blind and it was placebo controlled. And we used children with asthma because uh, homeopaths believe that children respond uh, better than adults and asthma is a condition that responds very well to homeopathy. And they got individualized homeopathy or placebo and our main, main endpoint was quality of life. The results showed that there was absolutely no difference. And our conclusion down there in red, no evidence that adjunctive homeopathic remedies are superior to placebo. So I, I could have just showed you, um, cherry picked this one single trial to impress you that uh, homeopathy doesn't work. In fact, today we have about 500 clinical trials, which in itself is interesting because lots of people say there's no evidence. There's plenty of evidence. 500 clinical trials is not nothing. Um, and if you have 500 trials, uh, it is uh, inevitable that some come out positive because of bias, because of cheating, because of uh, uh, coincidence, random positive, false positive result, etc., etc., and And then it's tempting to cherry pick and homeopaths like cherry picking. Um, create a, a positive result by uh, uh, cherry picking the positive studies. Um, to avoid this, uh, because that's basically cheating, to avoid this we need a, what we call a systematic review. We need to evaluate the totality of the reliable evidence. That's called a systematic review in medicine. And uh, we have plenty of systematic reviews of homeopathy. We, ha we have about 60 systematic reviews. And, and, and even these 60 don't all agree because some are better than others, some are more rigorous than others, some are done by homeopaths and some are done by non-homeopaths. I wonder is to do a systematic review of systematic reviews. Uh, and I published this in the British Journal of Pharm Clinical Pharmacology. And in case you can't read the uh, bottom line, I've uh, retyped it at the bottom. Clinical evidence of homeopathy does not warrant positive rec recommendation for its use 
in clinical practice, meaning there's no good evidence that homeopathy works for any condition whatsoever. Um, much later, the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia have repeated this. At, the, at that stage, there were 53 systematic reviews and they evaluated all these 53 and concluded the evidence does not show that homeopathy is effective. So, where does that leave us with homeopathy? Uh, a quick summary. It's, its assumptions fly in the face of science. I've told you how dilute they are. Uh, the the like, your, like principle is not very scientific. So um, uh, not uh, very plausible at all. 200 years of research have failed to pr produce compelling clinical evidence. I've shown you that as well. Um, it cause, can cause considerable harm. I will show you that in a minute. Um, yet it remains incredibly popular, not just in, in, in this country. Actually, in this country, it's, it's not, no longer very popular. But think of India, for instance, uh, or think of France, where I'm at present, or think of Germany, where I was born. Uh, homeopathy, homeopathy remains very, very popular. And this begs the question, why do some people swear by ineffective therapies? In other words, they say, I know it works. Uh, I don't need a scientist to tell me what works for me. I know better than the scientist. Um, to explain this a little bit closer, we need um, to abstract a little bit, and that's what I'm trying to do with the slides that follow. Um, schematically, what we see here is a patient or a group of patients feeling sick. They have se severe symptoms and therefore they go to a clinician, let's say to a homeopath. Um, the homeopath uh, applies a treatment that runs for a while and hopefully the severity of the symptom has diminished. The difference between initial and eventual symptoms is what I call the perceived therapeutic effect. And what we do in medicine, uh, any medicine really, not just alternative medicine, we equate this perceived therapeutic effect with the, the specific therapeutic effect, meaning that any clinician, as, as far as I can see, if a patient gets better, will say, well, lucky uh, uh, or, or very well. This was my, my, my treatment. Um, I've, I've done well. I've, I've chosen the right treatment. Um, and because of the treatment, you got better. That's a big, big misunderstanding because we have many other factors as well. We have the natural history of the disease. Um, lots of uh, conditions get better by themselves. A common cold, for instance, takes a week if you treat it and seven days if you don't treat it. We have the regression towards the mean, which is a statistical issue uh, that extreme values, if you measure them again, uh, return towards the mean. We have a, a, a thing called the Hawthorne effect. Just observing a patient will have an effect. Uh, we have lots of concomitant treatments. Patients use all sorts of stuff without telling the doctor. And if that is helpful, it mimics the effect of the treatment that is being observed or tested. We have the placebo effect which is uh, due to uh, classical conditioning and expectation. And we have something called social desirability. Uh, patients uh, who, are, um, uh, who have been treated nice by their doctor, uh, when the doctor asks them, uh, do you feel better? They say yes, uh, simply to be nice back. 
That's what we call social desirability. In other words, if we have no specific therapeutic effect, uh, if we have a useless treatment with no effect, we still can have a perceived therapeutic uh, effect. Um, and that means improvement after an in intervention is not the same as the improvement because of the intervention. Or to put it simply, the proof of anecdote is anecdotes and not evidence. My fifth point is that not all so-called alternative medicines are scams. This one, for instance, is probably not a scam. But uh, more seriously, um, people depicted me as as a as a quackbuster for for a long time, which I feel was not quite right. I was just applying science to uh, so-called alternative medicine, and one day I decided to publish a summary of all the treatments that, um, by the standards of evidence medicine found to be effective and here here is the original publication and the list uh, which you probably can't read it's also uh, totally outdated so it's not important to read it more recently I have published this book uh, this year uh, and in this book I have evaluated according to the standards of evidence-based medicine 150 different modalities of uh, so-called alternative medicine. And here you see those treatments uh, which uh, actually do work. Lots of herbal remedies, uh, not lots, but quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, dietary supplements, other treatments as well, uh, usually through a relaxation effect like uh, mindfulness, uh, progressive re muscle relaxation. So there are quite a few so-called alternative treatments that actually do work. And the best one probably is St. John's Ward for mild to moderate de depression. Here we have a meta-analysis, uh, which is a systematic review where you mathematically pool the, the data from different studies. In this case, uh, 30 randomized clinical trials showing that uh, St. John's Ward is definitely better than placebo and equally good as synthetic antidepressants. I say equally good, but I should say actually better than antidepressants because they, St. John's Ward has less side effects if you use it correctly. Um, and that brings me to the safety issue, which I, th I think is um, probably the most important issue in all of this, because people assume that these treatments are natural and natural is harmless, etc., etc. So the, the, the image with the general public is that so-called alternative medicine is safe. And that is clearly a misunderstanding. Here you have a little bit of a horror cabinet. Uh, on top, you ha have two pictures of the same man before and after taking uh, colloidal silver. Colloidal silver is uh, uh, being promoted for all sorts of ills. Uh, it doesn't help for anything, but it turns you silver. Uh, then you have uh, an abscess which is, was due to uh, acupuncture needle. Then you have a bright yellow eye, which is due or was due to uh, hepatitis, uh, uh, toxic hepatitis through a herbal remedy. Then you have these uh, terrible ulcers in the face of that woman, uh, which were due to... Uh, um, 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 Come, comes back in a, in, a, in a second. And lastly, the back of, of this, this man, um, you, you have the marks of some um, treatment that has gone wrong, uh, where you, you put vacuum uh, things on, on the back in, in order to 
create these little hematomas and they can get infected. This is called cupping. And, and, and this is called, uh, I, for, I forgot the, 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 the ulcers. It's an external treatment that is corrosive. Um, I think the adverse effects of alternative medicine are very important. And in 1996, we published this in, in Nature based on a very large sample of, of British users of SCAM. And in, in white, you see the results that we published uh, in, in Nature. And you, you see that we reported adverse effects of spinal manipulation in about 16% acupuncture, about 13% um, uh, homeopathy, about uh, Ten percent herbal medicine, about eight percent. In actual fact, as we know today, after much further research, uh, about fifty percent of patients having spinal manipulation, usually usually by a chiropractor, have adverse effects. With acupuncture, we were pretty close. Uh, homeopathy, um, homeopathy expect. 20% of homeopaths to have what they call aggravations of the presenting symptoms. And with uh, herbal medicine, it really depends on which herb we are talking about. Some herbs are very safe, some are not at all safe. And who's this sexy lady here? This is a photo model or was a photo model, Katie May, who had uh, uh, a neck problem, so a chiropractor felt dizzy afterwards, went to hospital, was diagnosed with a massive stroke and died only hours after. Um, this is what can happen with chiropractic spinal manipulation. Uh, anatomically, it looks like this. In red, we, ha we have an artery called the vertebral artery, which supplies part of the brain and it kinks over the uh, first uh, vertebra, the atlas. Uh, and at that juncture, it is very vulnerable uh, to being overstretched with certain movements, uh, man manipulations of the neck. And if it's overstretched, it can break up. And then you have a stroke and of a stroke, you can die. About 100 cases uh, reported in the literature, but definitely only the tip of the iceberg. Other uh, complications of uh, chiropractic, I won't go into the details, just to show you that a lot can go wrong with uh, chiropractic. But with all these, uh, what I call direct risks, um, I have to say the indirect risks of uh, SCAM are probably much more important. And here we're talking about uh, what is called medically called neglect. Um, people receiving uh, an alternative treatment instead of a normal treatment. Here we have an American publication showing what happens to cancer patients. They um, reduce their chance of uh, five years survival by 50% if they use alternative treatments. And uh, everybody's talking about vaccination these days. This is this happens, um, th th happens to be uh, quite important in alternative medicine as well. In terms of indirect risk, um, we have here a, a little survey that, that we've done uh, years ago at Exeter. <clears throat> We contacted 104 homeopaths, pretended to be a mother uh, concerned about MMR vaccination and asked their help. And we got advice from 40% of them uh, not to immunize the child, uh, only 3% advised to immunize the child, and the rest uh, were somewhere in, in the middle. This is just a small survey confirming what has been shown uh, over and over again, that uh, practitioners of alternative medicine often advise against vaccinating children. 
Uh, and here we have them. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is, is, is one of them. He's, he's not an alternative practitioner. He, he is the outgoing president, as you know. And he has a quote by him. And his um, big friend here is um, Andrew Wakefield, who was struck off the uh, doctor register in the UK for falsifying data related to vaccination, where, where he pretended that uh, that uh, vaccination, MMR vaccination in particular, caused autism. And the list of, of practitioners uh, who often advise against vaccination, physicians practicing in integrative medicine, doctors of anthroposophical medicine, naturopaths, homeopaths, chiropractors, all quite well documented that they um, have a strange attitude regarding vaccinations. And hence my probably most important slide of the evening, if used as an alternative for an effective treatment, even a harmless therapy can become life-threatening. The end is near. I'm going to summarize by just giving four bullet points here. The amount of misinformation about scam is frightening. Um, second, the evidence regarding eff efficacy is mixed and frequently negative. Third, scam is by no means devoid of risk. Fourth, very few scams generate more good than harm. And from that, I think it follows that the concept of integrating more scam into routine healthcare, such as the NHS, is nonsense. I hope you have enjoyed my talk. I hope also you have interesting questions, and I'm looking forward to answering them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ertz. That was a very, very interesting talk. Um, so now we can start off with the, the Q&A. Uh, so I ask anyone who's on YouTube or in Zoom uh, to type their questions into the chat. Um, if you want, you could uh, raise your hand as well if you want to ask for Ernst directly. Um, you can also um, message me privately and I can ask your question for you. Um, and just before we start that, I'd like to mention uh, for all Biosoc Life members, we have an exclusive discount on two of Professor Ernst's books. Uh, one of them is SCAM, so-called Alternative Medicine. And another one is Don't Believe What You Think. So we have 30% off on both of these books. And um, if you have signed up via the Google form, you will get an email with that discount. If you haven't, don't worry, you can message the Biosoc Facebook page and um, we will give you the code for that. Uh, so starting off with the questions, um, I have a question here. Um, in terms of spinal manipulation, how different is it to physiotherapy? Is the harm done by chiropractors caused by inadequate training, meaning, meaning the spinal manipulation is badly done, or is the practice itself dangerous? Um, good question, thank you. Um, the uh, chiropractors are adamant that they are the pr profession that knows best how to ma manipulate, and, and, and that may be true or not. Um, what makes chiropractors more dangerous is, is not the technique or the, the, the lack of technique, but the fact that they manipulate more than any other profession. You're right in assuming that uh, physiotherapists do spinal manipulation, but far, far less than, than chiropractors. Um, there are statistics that tell us that virtually every single patient seeing a chiropractor gets a spinal manipulation. And it's Im Im important to realize because they, they see the spine as, a, as an entity, as an uh, entire organ, you, you might go to the chiropractor, have back pain, and you get your neck manipulated because the chiropractor thinks there's a subluxation at, at the neck uh, causing the, the, the lower spine to be painful. And it's the neck manipulation that uh, is, is the danger uh, here. Osteopaths do a little bit more uh, spinal manipulation uh, than uh, physiotherapists, but still less 
than chiropractors and they have techniques which are softer and don't so often involve the, the dangerous moves, so to speak. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, do we know why St. John's wort is successful in the treatment of depression? Um, can conventional medicine mimic this mode of action? And uh, a similar follow-up from me is, why hasn't St. John's wort been formulated into a sort of modern medicine um, that we could use? Yeah, that's, that, that's an equally good question. We, we know, we know the, the mechanism of action, or we think we know at least one mechanism of action, and it, it is the, 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 actually the, the, the same as, as some um, uh, conventional antidepressants, that you, uh, synthetic uh, antidepressants that you buy or, or that, that you get prescribed by your GP if needed. Uh, why hasn't St. John's Ward been marketed as, as a pill actually it is marketed as, as a pill but it, it's you wanted probably to know why hasn't the active ingredient out of St. John's Wort been isolated and put into a pill um, that is usually what happens if, if, we f if, if we find a herbal remedy that is effective willow bark is a classic example was effective to uh, treat pain and somebody over 100 years ago isolated the molecule that is responsible for the effect put it in a pill and the pill everybody on the planet knows is called aspirin so in the, in the case of aspirin it was possible and very very successful in the case of st john's wort it doesn't seem possible because it's not one single molecule it's it's a whole family of molecule so if if you take one of the responsible molecule out put it in a pill it's not as effective as the whole plant extract and that happens quite often in 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 herbal medicine that uh, uh, Lots of molecules or families of molecules work in concert rather than a, a single molecule being responsible for the action. Right. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think a sort of follow up to this is I've had a couple of people ask is, would it be unfair to dismiss scam as a whole when some forms of scam have shown to be have shown to be effective, like St. John's Wall? And a, a similar question is that uh, you said that scams should not be integrated into the NHS, uh, but what if some some parts of it actually work? Should they have opportunities to be incorporated into routine healthcare? Yeah, uh, and that actually was one of my first slides. If, if something works, like St. John's Ward, then it becomes medicine. Um, it, 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 it hasn't quite big it, it takes time that process it hasn't quite become medicine in in the uk uh, it certainly has become medicine in 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 germany uh, doctors uh, lots of doctors in germany prefer to prescribe st john's word uh, instead of synthetic antidepressants and you can get it on on prescription and it's it's become mainstream that basically should and will happen with any uh, scam that is effective and therefore the the integration question doesn't arise because it's it's an it's a normal process that uh, uh, any scientifically proven treatment will go through uh, and and um, it takes a while as I, as I say and people might be skeptical and and want to make sure uh, and and often rightly so they want to to know that it is uh, better than the uh, conventional treatment on on offer in with St John's Wort that might be the probably is the case with lots of other uh, treatments on on my list which are effective that might not be the case so if if you have two treatments you're bound to take the more effective one. And if that is not the uh, alternative one, then um, tough luck, then it's uh, then uh, the, the convention. For instance, garlic. Garlic uh, also used much in, in Germany for lowering cholesterol. 
but and it's effective for that. But the effect size is much smaller than statins, for instance, and therefore statins are generally preferred for lowering cholesterol. Right. Thank you. Um, do you think it's ethical for mainstream doctors to provide information on uh, on complementary alternative medicine practices, which may not have strong clinical evidence? Uh, no, uh, it is not ethical for, for doctors to mislead patients uh, about anything. Uh, if uh, about a conventional treatment, uh, not nor about an alternative treatment. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not sure that doctors do this a lot. As I said at one stage in my, my talk, uh, conventional doctors in, in the UK show pretty little interest in, in the field. They, they smile at it and say, oh, well, yeah, if the patient wants it, why, why not? Uh, it, it, it cannot do much harm. And, and in, in that last bit of the sentence, they're definitely wrong. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we've got a comment here. Thank you for your work. It must feel sometimes like you're banging your head against the wall. Uh, so what can I, as a layperson, do to ensure against getting scammed? Well, uh, inform yourself. The, 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 the solution must be the, the information. That's why I'm writing a blog to inform people, uh, and I write it for lay people, not, not for uh, healthcare professionals. This is why I write books. I used to write uh, books for healthcare professionals uh, who uh, seem to be very disinterested in it, uh, and now I'm writing books for lay people. Uh, and... Um, I think that's much more important because contrary to conventional medicine, the, de de the decision to try this or that treatment uh, in, in the realm of scam is taken very often without consultation or, of any healthcare professional. You, uh, people talk to their neighbor and say, well, Take, take this or that, and it, it has helped me wonderfully. Um, my chiropractor has helped my back pain, etc., etc. So the, the, the decisions bypass the medical profession, and therefore it is important, I find, to inform the lay people. Information is the key. Yeah, indeed, thank you. Um, there's a question here. Um, I had a Baker's cyst behind the knee, didn't merit surgery. The very senior orthopedic specialist advised me to take cider vinegar and or sour cherry juice. I was astonished and told her that was the sort of advice my mother would have given. Is that alternative or nonsense? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it seems like a folk remedy uh, and, and not necessarily nonsense. Uh, I don't know how how your condition Im improved, whether it, it, it improved. Uh, and nobody knows how it would have developed if you hadn't uh, applied the, the treatment. So it's an anecdote and um, the plural of anecdote is anecdotes and not evidence. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, a question of my own, um, and this is about your research. And how has your research been affected by lobby groups and politicians who don't like the results that you bring out? <laughs> yeah, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> um, at, at one stage, that's probably why you asked the question, at one stage there was an intervention by the uh, first private secretary of Prince Charles, um, uh, alleging that I had broken confidence in, in one sp special report that was being uh, written up and commissioned by Prince Charles. Uh, that complaint prompted a very unpleasant investigation, uh, which eventually uh, resulted in me being pronounced innocent. But as this lasted 13 months, 
all the support had broken down. There was no more money. And eventually I had to go and I didn't have to go, but I did go into early retirement. So has it affected me bloody well? Yes. Um, we have uh, another question in the chat. Uh, so a lot of natural remedies are included in skincare products. Like for example, Lush is entirely based off natural products. Uh, so do they have a basis or is that also an example of scam? I, 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 I'm not sure uh, whether it ha has a basis. I'm not a dermatologist and I'm not familiar with the product you're talking about, but it's it's interesting in the sense that natural, the, 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 the uh, attribute of being natural is a, is a sales pitch. Anything needs to be natural. Anything from dog food to shampoo to, to uh, God knows what. Um, and, and that is part of the reason why uh, so-called alternative medicine is, is popular, because it is promoted as being natural. If, if you think again, a, a little bit more critical, uh, what is natural about sticking needles into people's skin, like in acupuncture? Nothing. What is natural about... Uh, jerking uh, 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 vertebra out of their physiological range of movement, like in chiropractic, nothing. What is natural um, uh, in uh, diluting remedies such that uh, they don't contain any uh, molecules of what it says on the bottle, like in homeopathy, nothing. Um, so, so the the the, the natural basically is a sales gimmick. And with the product that you mentioned, it, it might be the same, but I don't know. Great, thank you. Um, what are your opinions on the increase in popularity in uh, docu-series or documentaries on many of these so-called homeopathic medicines on popular streaming sites such as Netflix? Well, I, I don't watch them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they raise my blood pressure and then, uh, then and, uh, but, but you, you, you see a lot of good stuff on, 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 on YouTube as, as well, critical stuff, humorous stuff. And, and I think this, this, the best sol solution to uh, homeopathy is, is making fun uh, at it. And, and there's some hilariously funny uh, YouTube uh, things on, 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 on specifically on homeopathy. So uh, I'm, I'm not at all against YouTube or Netflix or anything like this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not very taken by, by uh, these uh, promotional films and I just don't watch them. So I don't have an opinion about them. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question in the chat. So about integrating scam in the NHS, um, if in some cases a scam remedy like a homeopathic one uh, would have a placebo effect, wouldn't it be safer for the normal GP to prescribe it to the patient while keeping an eye on him or her and intervening with standard medicine in case things get worse? Um, basically, couldn't this prevent um, some people from going to non-qualified practitioners? Yeah, that is, that is a very interesting argument. That's an argument that uh, one hears a lot. Um, uh, so basically, if homeopathy is just a placebo, it is still helpful because placebo is helpful. Um, and helping the patient is the most important thing in clinical medicine. That, that's in a way is true, but there are arguments against that as well. Um, uh, Essex uh, has it that, that I mustn't lie to a patient. Uh, if I give a patient uh, a placebo uh, and, and, and say it's a medication and that will help you, I'm lying. So it's unethical. The placebo effect is uh, unpredictable. Some people respond, some people don't respond. One person may respond today and might not respond tomorrow. Um, and most importantly, I don't need 
a placebo for a patient to benefit from the placebo effect. If I give my patient an effective treatment, meaning a treatment that works beyond placebo, and I do this with empathy, compassion, etc., then my patient will benefit from a placebo effect, no doubt. In addition to that, my patient will benefit from the specific effect of the treatment. So if I turn this around, just giving a placebo is cheating the patient out of something that is very, very important in terms of his treatment. Thank you, that was very well summarized. Um, if there are any last minute questions, um, please put them in now, um, because otherwise we seem to have come to an end. Um, looks like we don't have many more. So yeah, all that leaves me to say is uh, a huge, huge thank you to Professor Ernst for um, coming and sharing some of his thoughts with us. And uh, thank you to the audience. Thank you to everyone from uh, Students Against Pseudoscience, as well as BioSoc. And uh, just a quick reminder on the 30% discount on the books. Um, and I'll hand over to Louise to say a couple of words. Yeah, thank you. I just want to, I'll just uh, follow up on the same, in the same vein. Thank you so much, Professor Rand, for the wonderful and engaging talk. And uh, I think we all learned a lot. And, um, and thanks to all the wonderful people at Biosoc for uh, helping organize this event with us. And um, just to everyone in the, uh, in the audience, to please do check out Cambridge University Students in Pseudoscience if you're uh, interested. And uh, have a wonderful Christmas vacation to everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It was good fun. Thank you. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Cheers. Cheers.